All right, good morning. As I was introduced, my name is Jeff. If you don't know who I am, I sit over there. All right, so the authority of Scripture, if you were here last week, and I'm sure you all were, Dave got up here, and as usual for the end of the year, he gave a message exhorting us all to get on a yearly Bible reading schedule. And as is often stated, for someone to claim to be a Christian and to claim to follow the biblical teachings, it is near impossible to do so if you do not even have a thorough and ever-growing understanding and knowledge of Yahweh's written word. Well, today we're going to be looking essentially at the same type of topic, but from a different perspective as we discuss the authority of Scripture. We'll be covering a little background to the idea of what I mean by the authority of Scripture and also some of the historic uses and misuses of it. Sadly, in today's world, the authority of the Bible is greatly contested and controversy surrounds it at almost every turn, often even within the, Bible, within the body of the church itself. It's no surprise that every time you turn around, it seems that secular scholarship is continuing again to attempt to dismiss it, disprove it in some new way. The masses of churchgoers continue to repeat the same silly things against it that have been disproven over and over, and yet the errors just continue to spread. And all of that is quite understandable because among that crowd, there is really no place for an authoritative book that would alter their life and worldview. It is less understandable, though, when we turn to the church, the very people who profess to be the body of Christ, and find that the way they handle the very book that is their foundation of belief. We know the scriptures are the main source and cornerstone of teachings about Yahweh and all the related topics of Christianity. It's the basis for sources for where we get our beliefs of God, His attributes, the angels, the demons, etc., all that stuff that is out there. Yet there are those within the church who hold to beliefs on these topics that are not found in Scripture. So what sources are they basing these beliefs on? Some may think their beliefs come from the actual Word of God, but when you ask them which Scriptures they base it on, often they have no answer. It is just what they believe. Maybe it's based on some tradition or view that they were taught years ago as a kid, and it just continues on as tradition does. Sadly, there are many church-going Christians in this category who know what they believe, but not why or where their belief stems from. Ask them how many times they've read the Bible all the way through. Chances are they probably never have. Yet they have this belief system, one that they call and consider Christian, though it may stem from somewhere other than Scripture. Now, a while back I was following this conversation on Facebook between, you know, that place where all the truth is, Facebook. <laughs> between these two Christians, that would basically hold to our general eschatological view. And I was a little astonished to hear what one of them had to say. Shocking, right? Now this is the tail end of the conversation. And it initially had started over a hyper view that many people online tend to argue about. In this case, it was the idea of whether someone is born in original sin after AD 70. Now I won't digress in any details on this, this fringe of belief, it's not relevant for today. The original thread started when somebody posted a meme with this topic, and then somebody challenged him biblically, and this was the response he gave, which I thought a bit odd, for it's not really a biblical defense to the biblical challenge. Instead, he stated, I see that you uphold to all that is written in Scripture and search out what it says to be true for all ages, which means to me that you will forever be stuck in the time frame of the first century. So the first implication that he made is that all of Scripture, since written before the end of the first century, was only relevant to those people in that culture. More specifically, he would have believed that Christ and redemption, as described in the New Testament, would only have been directly applicable to those pre AD 70 time frame group of people. I know this may be totally alien to some of you, if you are unfamiliar with this view, but sadly it's kind of widespread online at least. And I used to see it quite often when I used to deal with these groups. I don't deal with these groups anymore. So now he went on to continue to say, look to Jesus Christ instead and understand if you become an overcomer, he will reveal to you hidden manna, not written in scripture, but nevertheless his word. Wow. <laughs> wow. I can tell some of you are immediately can see this is quite an unorthodox statement. Feel free to dismiss it, because again, this is not the topic for today. 
it's not even related, so I won't go any further on that. But still, it should be shocking to hear, as it is. It's such a demented comment to me that essentially it's attack upon and ultimately a dismissal of the authority of the written word of Yahweh. But wait, there's more. It does get worse. He continues to say, I think those who believe God has not spoken or that his word post AD 70 means nothing and that only scripture written before AD 70 are true for today in the new heaven and new earth. That is crazy speculation and worship of scripture. Again, I don't want to chase down all these comments or try to decide, you know, to dissect them or rebut them. I'm just wishing to show you the arrogance and outrageous comments made by some of those who claim to be Christian and who claim to be in our camp, if you want to take that broad camp. Now, that's, this kind of scenario fits right in with what David had spoke about in his two-part series back in March of 2019 on the dangers within preterism. It's just, you know, we can't align ourselves or find that we can walk with those professing to be Christian brothers just because they hold to a similar belief on certain areas, but are totally off the rails in other areas. There has to be more orthodoxy in the majority of areas than this. This online conversation did not go into detail on or make you didn't go into any detail on it, but it makes me wonder exactly what he's talking about. What exactly does he mean by the words post 8070? Where exactly do we have these words or writings of Yahweh? Do these supposed post 8070 words of God contain prophetic passages? And if so, have they been tested and proven 100% to be accurate? I am interested in reading them if they exist and comparing them to the written word. But in this case, he never explains what he meant, but he concludes by saying, I guess we have nothing to talk about then, for you do not believe anything beyond what is written 2,000 years ago, so I cannot help you because of your unbelief. You will just have to live with, that, with what you believe and lose out on what you could have had. Sadly, this type of mentality exists in Christian circles. And yes, this may be an extreme case, but this is the kind of mentality that you'll see people happen to go into when they start questioning Scripture in general or ignoring many parts of Scripture, or not knowing Scripture in general. It can stem from an issue of not holding to the understanding that the written, received Word of God is authoritative. And the issue is more greatly impacted when someone, looks, someone like this holds to a very narrow view of the audience and purpose of the story that the Scripture contains. From time to time throughout history, churches and councils have had to stop and reevaluate beliefs and practices in order to reroute areas that may have strayed off course slowly over time due to tradition. For many people these days, eschatology is being reevaluated, the people that we hang out with at least. Councils, creeds, and confessions tend to stem up from an unorthodox view when it pops up in the church and it challenges the church. And throughout history, they would pull these creeds and councils and create them. So the church councils meet, they study, they discuss, they eventually lay out a concise theological position on the topic at hand. Creeds can build then upon the foundations laid by other prior creeds and we get a systematic theology over time in the end of all these topics. Many scholars and historians will admit, though, that eschatology is a topic that very few church councils in the past have spent much time studying out in detail. They just continue repeating what tradition has said. There's been no real major council or examination on the topic, and that is one of the reasons there is so much crazy and diverse teachings out there today. And so for quite a few decades now, through the work of many great scholars, as well as lots of archaeological discoveries, there have been a ton of new historical and biblical cultural understandings that has shed new light and clearer understandings on many topics shrouded in the past. And more and more ancient Near East, Eastern and historical material is uncovered, studied and understood, I have no doubt that further understandings of Scripture will be formulated. Unfortunately, in a lot of the fringe circles, Little attention is given to what the actual scholarship is finding or to the skills that are needed to properly exegete their conclusions. Because of that, many self-proclaimed teachers are writing books and articles, gaining great followings on the social media sites. They go about propagating their truncated and erroneous views, leading people into all kinds of odd theological errors. And when they are questioned or challenged with the actual biblical text, we get this kind of silly lack of respect for the written word. For centuries, the Hebrew scriptures were revered, studied, and applied to every area of life by those seeking a better understanding of Yahweh. Many followers knew these scriptures inside and out. Maybe they did not always adhere to them or apply them correctly, but they honored them and studied them thoroughly. 
Every so often, traditions would grow in importance and lead people astray, and a reformation of thought and practice should come about to repair the things in time. It happens time and time again throughout history from the beginning, yet one thing was constant, the written scriptures became and were the central point that they returned to for these discussions. Then Yeshua came along, he opened the eyes of many of the followers, showing them many important points of the Hebrew scriptures that tradition had marred, misapplied, and pretty much negated. A new reformation took place with the old eventually passing away and the new taking over. During that first century, Yahweh spoke through them and new writings were made. By the early second century, those circulated writings started being collected and were acknowledged and eventually collected into a new set of authoritative scriptures. These new writings were revered similarly to the Hebrew writings from before. At the time, some of the greatest Christian minds were studying both portions of scripture, formulating creeds and doctrines from these understandings. They were using these scriptures as a basis for answering the worldly teachers and authorities around them. These scriptures provided them with answers and reasons for their faith and belief system. Preserving these scriptures even became a life and death matter, and many were tortured and died for their belief, defense, and protection. Fast forward to the 16th century. The challenge was made that things had gotten again off the path of truth in many areas, and that hundreds of years of formula forming traditions had become more central to the church instead of the authority of Scripture. Through a few bold men, the Reformation was born, and many gave their own blood in defense of the proper understanding of Scripture. For the churches and teachers that came out of the Reformation, the Scriptures held the central place of highest authority and were used to respond to the church's traditions. For a few hundred years after that, Scripture held a high honorable place in most churches, but as usually is the case, the honor would start to slip as traditions grew. In the early 1800s, we find a large amount of activity with different groups that hold to very odd and historically opposing views of Scripture and theology. Throughout the majority of church history, during those times when the Scriptures were given the place of authority, they were never referred to as simply a book of answers to certain questions that arose. They were usually always given a central place in the church's worshiping life. For instance, throughout much of church history, many churches used the book of Psalms as their songbook in worship. Many saw it as their main source of songs in worship. Other denominations held the belief that since the Psalms were divinely inspired, they should only be used in worship exclusively. Using the book of Psalms and other direct scripture-based scripture -based songs in the church singing service also served another purpose. Think about this idea for a moment. How many times has a song come on the radio that you knew very well as a kid or many, many, many years ago, but you haven't heard it for years, and yet after all that time, you still find yourself singing along, and you still know the words to it? It's because music is a powerful tool for almost programming things into your mind permanently. This was also a quite useful aid during those times in history when many in the ch of the church attendees lacked a real education or, or reading skills. Not only was singing the songs of Scripture over and over a tool for instilling the Scripture into the minds of men, the church also practiced the reading of extended passages over and over of the Scripture as part of the weekly liturgy or worship service. This meant the people could hear, who couldn't read, they could hear and ultimately become very familiar with whole sections of Scripture as they heard and often repeated them themselves week after week. The same idea is the reason that some churches in the past established a written book of prayer. Through the repetitiveness of reading pre-constructive constructive prayers, it established memorization and an aid in knowing and talking to Yahweh. While today many of us look back at these types of services and laid out liturgies, and we kind of jokingly say they're high church, because of all their seriousness and high reverence, it did serve a purpose for the people. It also stemmed from a belief a lot of times in the seriousness of what it means to come into the presence of Yahweh each week. They could look at one of them pesky Old Testament stories like the one of Nadab and Abihu and glean from it an aid in their worship. We're told in that passage, now Nadab and Abihu, the son of Aaron, each took a censer and put fire in it and laid incense on it and offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from the Lord and consumed them and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord has said. Among those who are near me, I will be sanctified, and before all the people, I will be glorified. And Aaron held us peace. So they would look at that, and they would conclude, first off, A, it's a serious thing to come before the Lord. 
He's holy. And that B, there are parts of the worship service, all parts of the worship service should be based on what Yahweh has told us to do. And building from there, and the authority of Scripture as central, they would end up with what we'd call a high church service to kind of be serious in front of God. So for centuries, reading and studying the Scripture was seen as a central way in which we can grow in the knowledge and love of God. All of this to say they considered the Scriptures the central way in which God addresses His people and used it prominently in every aspect of the worship service to Yahweh. It was needed in order to grow to understand truth more fully, as well as to develop the moral muscle to live out the gospel in the way that Yeshua commands, amongst the surrounding world that seeks to pull us in every other direction from it. In contemporary culture, things are not always quite this way. We have things like the emergent church, where almost anything goes in the name of love. We have the seeker-friendly churches, where the authority of Scripture takes a back seat for fear of offending or scaring anyone off. No, ma no longer is the Lord high and lifted up and given the place of authority amongst, against all worldviews. No longer do churches preach and seek to live lives in conformity to the teachings of Scripture. Now it is all about making the message as palatable as possible, to not offend anyone and to grow the numbers. As, part of the Bible, as parts of the Bible become more politically incorrect in our culture, many churches do not stand up for the truth. This has caused the church as a whole entity and body to suffer in its efficacy to the world around it. And the divisions just continue as more and more various teachings and practices divide the people. Much of this stems from a lack of real knowledge of Scripture, which cripples the churchgoer from being able to spot false teachings as well as the ability to provide a reason, in and out of season, for their faith. The words of Paul to Timothy should cut them like a spiritual deja vu. Click, I say. I do fully testify then before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who is about to judge living and dead at His manifestation and His reign. Preach the word. Be earnest in season, out of season. Convict, rebuke, exhort in all long-suffering and teaching. For there shall be a season when the sound teaching they will not suffer, but according to their own desires to themselves they shall heap up teaching, teachers, itching in the hearing, and indeed from the truth the hearing they shall turn away, and to the fables they shall turn, be turned aside. For many churches, scriptures become a lot of different things. Some see it as nothing more than a book of laws and stories that reminds us of people and events far distant from our life and troubles. It takes a place where it, it takes a place where it has little direct effect or influence on life today. Others use it as a book of parables, stories, or examples that they could use to make modern day application, whether that application is related to the original scripture passage teaching or not. Relevance of many of the teachings has become suspect and therefore often ignored, twisted, or explained away. Some professing Christians get embarrassed about portions of Scripture and make excuses for it instead. It is very rare, as we know, to find churches that practice expository preaching verse by verse through the Scripture because that means that they'll have to deal with these troubling passages that they want to gloss over. Sadly, many pas pastors do not even study the Word with any real effort. They simply preach through their store-bought sermons or ear-tingling, feel-good pep talk messages with no meat or teaching in them. Any kind of deep study of the scriptures or historical studies is often non-existent, and furthering their, under, their misunderstanding and furthering their understanding of scripture is dead. I think over time, people and preachers have gotten comfortable with tradition, and they just kind of go along with the flow, and they keep the peace. Now, of course, this is painting with the broad brush. Obviously, not all everybody falls into this type of category, but those who don't tend to be the, you know, exception. And unfortunately, they don't make as much of a ripple in the pond of Christianity because they have little effect on the progress of things as they go. So on the topic of the authority of Scripture, let's start by defining what I mean when I say this. I'm not so much saying that the words on the page in a book specifically should be lifted up as a book of authority. The book in and of itself is not the authority, but it is the authority of the triune Godhead who speaks and teaches and is revealed through Scripture. The Scripture tells us in many places that all authority comes from God. In the Old Covenant era, God at times spoke directly to people like Moses. 
At other times, he sent spiritual messengers, angels, to speak to them. He also spoke through his spirit to the prophets at other times. In all cases, there was authority to what was being spoken. The opening comment of the book of Hebrews tells us how in times past, God spoke through the prophets. But at that time, in the opening of the first century, he was speaking through his son. The words of God before came through prophets and others, but now they were coming directly from the son. This is the same son that John tells us is the word. And this word is not the type that is written down. It became flesh. Then, after the resurrection, Yeshua declares in Matthew 28, 18, that all authority has been given to him. So the authority of Scripture is not such an easy thing to define and is further confused by our current understanding and use of the term authority. For some, when you say the authority of Scripture, they think along the terms of the inspiration of Scripture. To others, authority of Scripture may be related to specific translations. For instance, those who, like I used to believe, believe that the KJV translation is the only divine inspired translation and the authoritative word of God above all others. The authority is in the story on the pages, though. However, that story or major pieces of it can be condensed and packed into theological terms that are not always fully understood. Unfortunately, packing them this way can sometimes cause the details to get lost over the years. We have built whole doctrinal systems around words that are not contained within the biblical text. That's true. But we use these words to more concisely contain our biblical theology. Words like the Trinity or the Atonement. You know, words that are not actually in Scripture, yet we use them to condense the larger body of work so that we can carry it around in conversation more easily. I like how one writer describes it, using the symbolism of suitcases. Suitcases enable us to pack a bunch of complicated stuff into one easily carried container. However, we must never forget that the purpose of doing so is so that we can unpack those things once we get to where we're going. He goes on to state how too often debates take place with people who end up hitting each other with the, over the head with their suitcases rather than unpacking the theological terms to lay them out and inspect them. Long years in the suitcase have made some of the contents go moldy, and they would benefit from, from, some, uh, from some fresh air and perhaps a hot iron. However, when that starts to happen, that'll send off red flags in the minds of some people who feel that their traditional understandings are being attacked, and you can't reconsider that, so again, more battles ensue. When we speak of the authority of Scripture, we must unpack that suitcase and realize that we are speaking of authority that is mediated from that which Yahweh possesses and from which Yeshua possesses, possesses as His Son. So it is to be seen as the authority of God exercised through the story of Scripture. As I mentioned before, the authority of Scripture does not mean that we honor just a book filled with quaint teachings, sayings, or answers to problems as they occur. While the scriptures do contain elements of that, but that is not what I mean when we act of what we actually have in the scriptures. What we do have is a whole story. And within that story, we find the authority of God given to us if only we care to dig in, unfold, and understand it in its context. Unfortunately, the church has divided this large story into neat little pieces of out-of-context sayings and smaller stories and misapplies them in all sorts of causing all, all sorts of unrelated problems or applying them to unrelated problems. In order for the Bible to have authority and the effect it was designed to have, it is necessary that we hear it as it is, we understand and apply it as it was intended to be implied, applied, and we do not chop it into things it was never meant to say. Plenty of examples can be given and I know you all could share numerous ways people have taken pieces of Scripture out of context to make it say things it does not. I hear this kind of stuff almost daily with the Christians around me that I work with, and that is not an exercise of the authority of Scripture. The authority comes from the whole as we understand the inner working story, which is a road leading to the saving work of Christ that ends a very long story of Yahweh's working in history. This authority is a concept of God's sovereignty and rule, or better stated, His kingdom. Scripture reveals to us the story of God dealing with His people, and the ultimate ending of the story is His triumphant victory against the sin, the death, 
and that which has been the wedge in their relationship from the beginning. By the time of the first century, many of the Hebrews had an expectation that God would usher in a physical, political kingdom, overthrowing their physical enemies and establishing them as an earthly ruler. However, we know that they were misunderstanding the promises of God. And for that, they missed the true essence of the kingdom that was breaking into the world at that time. For us today, the present kingdom is which, in which we are living and seeking to expand is done so based on that same authority of Scripture, based on what we see as the story of how God revealed work, how, he, how God revealed working in times past. And we rely on that for our current work. We must see, therefore, that when we speak of the authority and place of Scripture today, we speak not just about true information contained within the Scriptures, about how God has and is working in the kingdom. But we are to see the scriptures as an active part within the continuing kingdom process. When read frequently, read properly in all areas of context, understood more accurately and applied more properly, the scriptures reveal and stand as the authority by which Yahweh actively changes lives and advances the kingdom. There are many extreme methods that people use when dealing with scriptures. They may look at them as strictly a historical account of a story told at the time it was written, or they butcher and abuse it to make points that it was never intended to be made with. Another extreme is they ignore the fact that there are multiple types of literature contained in scripture, and they seek to understand and explain them all in the same way. When they ignore things like the metaphoric, the parabolic, the apocalyptic, or the spiritual, and they seek to make it all just one type, or worse, they try to make them all conform to a woodenly literal meaning. A proper handling of the scripture revealed to us the way that God not only has, but how he does work in dealing with mankind, what his plan was and is for further expanding his kingdom to the world around us, and ways that we can be transformed and used along the way. The people of Israel were a people that heard from God. However, we cannot reduce their scriptures down to just a simple record of revelation and history. This was not their intent, and it should not be ours either. While we indeed must not seek to apply to ourselves those specific and direct promises that Yahweh makes to His ancient people, we likewise cannot just blow through it as history only. A prime example, and one that I speak of often, I'm sure some of you know where I'm going with this, Everyone's favorite ripped out of context and misused text from Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. I won't go into any detail breaking this down. Just I'll simply ask you, go back and read it in context. Start with verse 1 and read through to 11, verse 1 of 29. As you read, fill in the typical grammar rules that you probably learned as a kid. Ask yourself the who's, the what's, the when's, the where's, the why's. And at the end, you'll see what this verse is talking about. So on the one hand, it is wrong and erroneous if I read this and think that the you here is speaking of me. But it is likewise wrong if I simply read the words of Jeremiah as if they were just his. And not with an understanding that they, all of Jeremiah's words, are the words of Yahweh. And that I can learn much from the story here. While Jeremiah is speaking and dealing with the distinct people at a distinct time with distinct specific issues, that does not mean that we cannot glean much about the attributes and purpose of Yahweh that can be applicable to our own understandings of His working with us. For such a verse as this, while the promise of welfare and not evil cannot be assumed as belonging to each and every one of us, regardless of what the health and wealth preachers teach, we can glean this fact. Yahweh knows the plans He has for us whatever they are. They are in His hands, and we can take comfort in that. <clears throat> Scripture was never to be considered simply the imparting of information or to remind them of a specific religious experience of old. It was not just an old storybook or a book of rules or a book of proverbial saint teachings. It contains the words and works of Yahweh with His people. It contains a story that was written to the people as a reminder of their place and purpose in the world of their calling to serve God who brought them out of the land of Egypt in bondage. It was written so that it would direct and shape the lives of God's people. It was written to reveal the character, attributes, and workings of Yahweh through the workings He had with His people. If you do a quick study in the Scriptures on the word remember, 
You'll find it's something that Yahweh continually tells his people. They were to remember the things in order for it to continue to shape their lives and the lives of their children and future generations like us. Many of the things in Scripture are written down so that we will remember how Yahweh works and what he does. Scripture was the authority because it contained the controlling story that told Israel its identity and destiny as a people of God. They were a covenant people through whom the power and justice of God would ultimately break through into the world as a whole. The story and authority called them to obedience to the call of God, making them the model that later all the world would be called to live under. Scripture was to be the controlling narrative and guide for daily life, and it is likewise to be so for us today. The Scripture was read, studied, taught, prayed, and sung by them in the temples and early synagogues, and was to key, the key to shaping the people who were longing for the coming kingdom. Of course, by the time Christ appeared, things had gotten all mucked up again. Tradition and additional laws and guidelines had blurred the overarching story. There were many different groups having varying interpretations of what was truly meant by following the Scriptures. This has unfortunately been the way mankind has always fallen into, and similarly, it's why we see so many different views and denominational practices even today. Let us move on into the days of Yeshua, though. The time had come for the ultimate consummation of the promises throughout this long history. The time when all that was promised was actually begin to break into the world. Israel had continued to fail time and time again, not only through disobedience, but in understanding, following, and fulfilling the ways of Yah that Yahweh had laid out for them in the story. Due to that, the promised Messiah had arrived to bring the promise of the story of Scripture to its climax, and He would do what they failed to do. He would be the means to complete, of complete obedience to God through which the kingdom would be accomplished. Yeshua comes onto the scene, and at times He challenges and reveals what the, that the leaders had strayed and forgotten the story. Their view of the authority of Scripture was skewed. At one session, He directly pointed out, You are wrong because you know neither the Scriptures nor the power of God. Another time he berated them for making tradition above Scripture. So for the sake of your tradition, you have made void the Word of God. You hypocrites, well did I say a prophesy of you when he said, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And of course, there is a time when he criticized Nicodemus for his lack of knowledge. Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Things were beginning to happen. The word was before, that beforehand was authoritative to the life of the covenant people was being fulfilled right before their eyes, yet they were missing it. A call to accept the Spirit's life-changing power was being offered, yet many of them were missing that too. Salvation was being offered, both physical and spiritual, and they were missing that too. By following tradition and man-made religious desires, they were robbed of the promise they longed for. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul proclaimed, I deliver to you as of first importance that which I, received, I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, and that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. In doing so, he was not saying that if he tried hard enough, he could scrounge around and find some pieces of Scripture text that would sort of kind of relate to be stretched to make the point of what he's trying to discuss here. No, he was saying this was always part of the story. The climax of the story, the promises of Yahweh fulfilled in the promised Messiah. The authority of the Hebrew Scriptures during that early church period was pointing to the central figure in the story. It was Yahweh and the works he was doing through his Christ. Here is the key figure that was promised. Here is the fulfillment of promises given beforehand. Yet even with their past history of a high view of the authority of Scripture, many were influenced by modern tradition and were therefore missing what was going on right before their eyes. God's kingdom promises were about empowering the covenant people to overcome their was not about over empowering people to overcome their political enemies. It was not about setting up a physical kingdom with an earthly king. This, that may be what they were envisioning at the time, and sadly what people seem today to be longing for, but the kingdom was focused on righting the wrongs, bringing forgiveness and reconciliation with Yahweh 
bringing in a new life, a new heavens and a new earth relationship with a new people, and he being the ruler of all. The powers of the world were being confronted by the authority and reign of Yahweh through the preaching of the apostles, and that preaching was bearing fruit by the transformation of the lives of many people, showing that the start of God's reformation of the world was present. The word was being preached. The story of Israel was reaching its finality in Yeshua. The call of God was now being extended further unto a new and renewed people as promised, and that word was flesh, and his authority was powerful. Following the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ, the spirit-assisted ministry of the apostles became the extension of that authority as they went about turning the world upside down, as we're told in Acts 17.6. Over time, the words and writings of these early teachers began to be acknowledged as also authoritative, and therefore the New Testament scriptures were compiled and placed alongside of the Hebrew scriptures in their importance and authority. The early church was therefore a community created by God's call to hear and obey the word of the gospel, being that of the fullness of the written Hebrew scriptures embodied in the word Yeshua, announced to the world through the authoritative New Testament scriptures and taught as truth within the church assembly. As we are told in Acts, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Recent studies had shown that the letters and writings of Paul and other New Testament writers have revealed that they were indeed self-conscious of the fact that they, what they were doing, saying, and writing was by a calling from God and was being done as an authorized teacher by the guidance of the Spirit. They were shaping and energizing the new people of Christ through their written word. They knew that they were not simply writing about the kingdom of God, but what they were doing was actually designed to be a means to bring it into the world around them. Now, whether they had ever envisioned a time when their writings would be compiled into a book, along with the others, like we have today, it's uncertain. But they do seem very conscious of the fact that their unique vocation in what they were doing and writing and the, had an impact on the situation of their time. The early church continued to believe that the Hebrew Scriptures were still the writings by which God had given the people their story and was the focal point of His work in the world and His revealing of the Messiah which had come. It contained that what was needed and was authoritative, and they used it as a key means of preaching the plans and powers of Yahweh. However, they read these scriptures in a new way, recognizing that some parts of these scriptures may not have the same relevance to them as a new covenant people. But this was not necessarily because they felt these parts were wrong or bad or not actually from God or not actually God-given. They understood that while parts simply belonged to the part of the story that was now completed, having reached its climax in Christ, yet they were still authoritative in that they still revealed the power and character of Yahweh in the story as a whole. Sadly, today, most Bible readers ignore or they give much less weight to the understanding of the Hebrew Scriptures, viewing them as old and or obsolete. They see them as having no real application to us modern New Covenant saints. Their lack of understanding them as a bulk of the main story causes them to totally miss key aspects of what is going on, which ultimately causes them to misinterpret many of the happenings occurring later on in the latter parts of the story. The authority contained within the Hebrew Scriptures is still there, if properly understood through the story of Christ. The story of Christ, however, makes little sense when it is stripped from the context of the full story. Oftentimes we as modern readers are amazed at how some New Testament writers actually use some of the Hebrew Scriptures to make a point. We look and wonder to ourselves, how the heck did they get that understanding out of this verse? And part of this may come, of course, because we are not as well steeped in Hebrew culture as they were. Many people like to accuse the New Testament writers of treating the Hebrew Scriptures as a grab bag for which they could pick and choose pieces that they wanted to use while leaving pieces behind that they did not. Because of this erroneous view, many people feel we can do the same thing with the whole of Scripture today, tearing things out of context and using them as we wish. 
This comes from a failed understanding of how the early Christians understood the authority of Scripture in their use of it. Now, we've already mentioned Jeremiah 29. Here are a couple more common ones heard frequently that kind of get under my skin at least. And I made reference to this earlier if you were here. Anyway, people will say at the prayer group, for instance, well, you know, where two or three are gathered together, Christ is there with us. Now, of course, they're attempting to claim where Christ says, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am, there am I among them. So we have that in Matthew 18. But when you take that verse out of context, like some have, like it's some kind of a fortune cookie statement of theology, and they treat it as a blanket statement saying that when two or three Christians come together for any reason, Christ is there. But is that really what this is saying? This verse comes at the end of a discussion in Matthew 18, which is a detailed description of how the church leaders are to judge and apply church discipline. So, this is relevant to making judgment in a disciplinary situation and not to be understood as a blanket statement that if two or three of us are hanging out, Yeshua is hanging out there with us. Another one that kind of irks me is a truncated view of Isaiah 55:11, which is usually stated after someone has just spoken or, you know, some kind of an evangelism. They'll claim, well, God's word will not return void. As if to teach that any time any part of the word of Scripture is, re is repeated, it will inevitably be effective. But is that what, this, what the verse promises? A return of goodness each and every time Scripture is used, spoken, or taught? Let's read what the verse actually says. For even if we keep it out of context, if you read it just out of context, it still tells you a different story. So shall my word be that goes out of my mouth. It shall not return to me empty. This is Yahweh speaking, in case you don't know that. But it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the things for which I sent it. So it's not talking about, it's not about us talking to God to someone else. It's about God sending out His own word. And in the context of the story it's in, it's about His sovereignty. They will not fail to accomplish what He sets them out to do. And then one of the main ones you hear all the time, and I know tradition even has it embroiled into us, is the term, in Jesus' name. Here's the magical phrase. It's everything we need. It's, it's all we need to get everything we need. When you pray and you want them answered, close with these words. When you need a demon gone, cast him out with these words. If you need to claim something you want, make sure you say these words. After all, Scripture says, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do. And the Father may be glorified that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Is this to be understood as teaching that simply saying the name will produce the effects desired here? Is asking in His name that magic that binds God to honor our will? If so, what name are we to use? If so, what name is the most magical? Is it the more... yeah? Is it the more modern English translation of J-E-S-U-S -S that most today's Christians are familiar with? A word that was never uttered from anyone's lips until a few hundred years ago? Maybe it's the Greek translation of the name like in the Greek manuscripts. Maybe it's a Latin one like in the Latin manuscripts. Or maybe an original Hebrew one since he came from a Hebrew family, had a Hebrew name. Doesn't it matter which one, if it's supposed to be magical like this? It's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it seems that if we have to literally speak His name to get these benefits, then we need to use the right one, right? Or does God just honor any name because, you know, He knows what we mean. Or could it be that maybe literally saying this phrase and this name is not really the point being made here? Time doesn't allow me to go into detail here. We have messages on the church site. David has dealt with this. I'll give you something to go research. But hopefully you can see that we are not being told to end every thought and prayer with some magical phrase by literally saying, in the name of Jesus. Though that is what our modern tradition has instilled in all of us. And, you know, we still, we still do it. It's not bad, but it's just, you know, is it needed? 
When Christians go around stripping pieces and parts of Scripture out to make use of how they please, that is not honoring the authority of Scripture. And in the end, it does more damage to Christianity in, when it continues to be done. As mentioned, there are parts of the old that are no longer actively applicable to New Covenant living. But, as I said before, it's not because they were bad, and it's, not, it's just because their purpose has come to completion. I like the way the N.T. Wright illustrates this. When a group of travelers on a ship on the sea reached land, they leave the boat and continue their travels on land. They did not leave the boat because it was bad, malfunctioning, or of no use, but because that portion of the journey requiring it was over. The travelers go on, but the ship portion is never forgotten. It is still a vital part of their story and is necessary in understanding how they got to their destination. Those Hebrew scriptures are the core to everything the New Testament writers used and preached from. It is that necessary part of the story that gets us to the newer sections. Without a thorough understanding of the Tanakh, it is near impossible to grasp the gravity and importance of the things happening in the New Testament. The, the written and spoken word was a summons to the people to make a costly decision to live on the basis of the story and to reflect the image of the Creator. It was a call to kingdom living as opposed to the typical worldly cultural living. It is about renewal through the reign of God that was breaking into the world around them. The New Testament period understood itself to be the New Covenant Charter, the word that would form the New Covenant telling of the story, and by which humanity would be formed, reformed, and transformed into God's people for His new world. That is what they left for us, and by which we can consider what the authority of Scripture looks like in practice. For, for centuries... Scripture furnished the church with the power and authority to proclaim and live within the new reign of God. It sustained them through prayer and guidelines for living righteously. It gave them the answers to questions when, when they were attacked. It was honored, protected, and defended. Scripture remained the central focus throughout much of the time, and because of the centrality and authority of Scripture, with their understanding of the way the whole story works and of their renewed Jewish status, they did not easily fall prey to other gospel messages that strayed from the real story. Tracing the history from the beginning, through the call of Abraham and the creation of Israel, through the transforming period of Christ's day and into their own time, they understood they were being called, they were being obedient still to the one world tr transforming call. These people knew that the authority of Scripture, they knew the authority of Scripture and they stood up for it. And oftentimes in those early years, it led to them to a horrible death as a martyr for their beliefs. We hear similar atrocities for the sake of the scriptures even today from the stories that are read from the persecuted church. Unfortunately, in later centuries of the church, the whole renewed Israel dimension of the story began to fade, and with it, a detachment of the scripture authority and its narrative concept that led to the goals of kingdom life. As was often seen in the lifetime of Israel, tradition began to triumph over the scripture. Instead of the overarching story dealing with the corporate goals of the reign of God breaking into and overcoming the world, the story was divided into old versus new. In the place of the whole story, things, were indivi things like individual faith, individual holiness, and personal salvation became the goal. Individualism became the, more of a focus. Instead of the continuing story of God's kingdom reign spreading through the vehicle of Scripture, some traditions became more centralized on using Scripture for two main functions. First, Scripture became, became regarded as a court of appeal, basically a source or rule book from which doctrines and ethics could be pulled from as needed, and from, what it, and from wherever needed in order to make the case. Proof texting became the game, and the full story began to fade. Secondly, it began to be used as a tool which individual readers could use in order to hear God speaking to them personally, to nourish them spiritually in their own devotions. Again, more individualism where individual application and proof texting took precedence. Slowly, the whole story began to fade, and it became more personal, and in many ways it began to be looked at as being more allegorical than it's probably intended. Allegory has its place in Scripture, but some uses of it go too far and are applied erroneously because they misunderstand the culture and the times of the writing. 
that can cause things to be steered away from the Jewish world understanding in which the first century writers were living and teaching. When pushed too far, it can remove the continuing story aspect of Scripture, therefore removing the Judaic context, which is already strained by the heavy Hellenistic mindset that most modern Christians approach Scripture from to begin with. This leads to further confusion of the story. During the medieval period in history, allegorical exegesis continued, but became more refined and imaginative. Even apologetics from that time period noted how if allegory is allowed to take over, almost anything can be proved from Scripture, which results in some pretty highly speculative theories, as you can imagine. Taken too far, this takes away the authority of the whole story and again makes the Scripture more of a set of tools filled with various pieces that are used and twisted to prove whatever the point of contention happens to be. The important question to ask in such situations should be, is Scripture being used to serve an existing theology or vice versa? Over time, this type of approach led the church to develop many doctrines that became solidified into tradition. Over still more time, those traditions began to be looked at as parallel authority next to Scripture because those tradition suitcases had been packed for so long. No one took the time to unpack them to see where they originated from. Early on when the church spoke of tradition, they used it to mean that the church, they, to say what the church has said as it has historically been expounded in Scripture. By the time of the 16th century, though, the authority of tradition was regarded as essential and actually an interpretive framework for understanding the Bible. While the Reformation did much to break that trend, tradition comes to rear its ugly head over time and has done so in recent centuries, even in most of our Reformed denominations that have always been strongly opposed to it. Of course, even way back in early Hebrew scriptures, that was an issue. They had the written Torah as well as the unwritten Torah that was supposedly given on Mount Sinai as well, yet they continued to fall away. In essence, the belief is, if something is a, is a well-established tradition, even if there is nothing about it found in Scripture, it is often still taught as authoritative, even if it is shown to be against the actual teaching of Scripture. However, turning back to the Reformation, their view of sola scriptura, Scripture alone, was a pro protest against the strength of tradition in the church at the time. It was a call to go back to Scripture, unpack the suitcase, and prove or disprove the established traditions. To the Reformers, Scripture trumps to tradition as it should. They also set out to restore a literal sense of Scripture over against some of the other ways the medieval church had been viewing things. And of course, they restored to Christians the right to have and read the Word of God in their own language instead of the previous view of keeping it in the hands of the Latin reading elite. Now, when the Reformers speak of the literal sense of Scripture, we must understand that they are not speaking as most do today and in using that term. The dispensational cry for the literalism of Scripture is fine, and then they hyper-spiritualize other areas to make it fit their view. But their view is not, of literal is not the same as what the Reformers were saying. No, when the Reformers speak of scriptural literalism, they speak actually of the literal understanding that the writers and listeners of the time would have approached the Scripture with. This means if the original intent of the section was metaphoric, then a metaphoric view is the literal understanding. It meant that looking at each different literary types as they should literally be taken. This can become confusing to us by way because of the way we use the word, but it's something we must learn to overcome. For instance, if you look at Psalm 18.8, speaking of Yahweh, we are told, Gone up has smoke by his nostrils, and fire from his mouth consumeth. Coals have been kindled by it. If we use the language of literal, as many believe it is used today, it would lead one to believe that what we are saying is that physical smoke came out of Yahweh's physical nostrils and literal fire from his mouth. But to the Reformers, a literal view of this verse is actually seeing the beauty of metaphor and the understanding it to be speaking of the indignation of the living God against his enemies. I'm sure most of us here would already grasp that as we see this type of 
usage throughout scriptures, especially when it comes to, you know, eschatology stuff. But many literalists, readers, do not understand it that way, and they miss many of the nuances and beauty that is found written in the various types and sections of scripture. It is this type of understanding of literal that allowed the reformers to understand the metaphor behind Yeshua's words when he speaks at the Last Supper of taking and eating of his body, which the Roman Catholic Church understand as being more of a modern literal approach to it. I could go on and on with other examples of types of scriptural usages of differences, different writing styles, but let's wrap this up. The whole point of the message today is to kind of piggyback off of what Dave's exhortation was last week, to get into a reading plan, preferably one that will take you through the whole scripture frequently. I know a lot of friends and people who do, you know, the Bible programs will walk you through little studies, and they do that all year long. But, you know, that doesn't always cover, like expository preaching, it doesn't, it, it's not going to cover every verse like an expository preaching would and reading would. So adding to what he said, as just a reminder to help us all to think maybe a little more rightly, maybe a little more highly of Scripture, to seek to instill not only a respect and desire to properly handle it in general, but also maybe to have a greater desire to read, study, and stay in it regularly to continue growing and understanding all that Yahweh has provided within it for our belief and benefit. This is not a new or novel concept coming from this pulpit. We hear it again and again, and today you're hearing it yet again. Read the Word. Read it often. Study it regularly. View it as authoritative. If not, you will surely mishandle, misquote, and misuse it like so many others do in this day and age. Scripture is already authoritative, but it must be restored to the proper place of authority in the Christians' minds these days. And that is not going to happen until the people of Yahweh read it, understand it better, and handle it more properly to be the authority for the kingdom age in which we live in. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. We just pray, Lord, that you would make it in the hearts of all people who claim to be followers of you, that they would just cherish it, honor it, seek to know it. Just read it, Lord. We just pray that you would instill in them a desire to read it. We thank you so much, Lord, that we are exhorted frequently to do so here. We thank you so much, Lord, that you've made it so easy. You've given us the word. We're able to read it and just continue to study it. We thank you so much for the tools we have in this modern day and age where we can carry so much around just in the little suitcase of our phone if we would only unpack it and read it. We thank you so much for the many blessings. Amen. Now, obviously, there's no room for questions here because what are you going to say? Do I need to read my Bible? Yeah, okay. <laughs> but I'll open the floor here if you have any questions. No. Anybody else? Anybody else? Yes. So I'll preface it, the question with this. I know there's a lot of, there's always people that will disagree on a lot of different things, but is there a reliable a source? that could kind of help guide people into the various literary senses of the scriptures so that they know that this is supposed to be poetic, this is supposed to be metaphoric. You know, see yeah. where I'm going? Is there such a thing? I think there's so many of those. Yeah, it's not yeah. who do you trust and where you do it. But I mean, I think the more you read, you more kind of get a consensus. Everybody agrees this is poetic. Everybody right. agrees the metaphors. That's right. Yeah, no, it takes some study, but I mean, yeah, I don't know if there's, is there one book, you know. Yeah, because I mean, just right. reading through the Bible yearly, you kind of no, I, yeah. I mean, you kind of know some things, but other things, it's there's that question, you know, how is this supposed to be meant? So I understand there's no yeah. <laughs> end all to be all. Obviously, reading gets you familiar with everything, but yeah, it's that that will be the studying aspect of now you got to find other sources, some of the scholars who maybe have determined that, and weigh the balance, you know, weigh out the arguments. Right. If they say this is you know metaphorical, but this is whatever, so. But yeah, a lot of that I think is pretty, you know, evident, you know, but not always. Yeah.
especially like books like Isaiah, yeah. Revelation. You know, David, you got an answer for that? <laughs> no, there's just there's a lot of books out there that are helpful, but again, it's finding. <laughs> yeah. Reliable right, sources. That's the is, what's Anybody reliable? today can write a book. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you want to follow somebody who has some idea of what they're talking about scholarly. <laughs> uh, that, that's that's very helpful. Yes, you got, you got a book. I'm not sure. <laughs> <there. I wanted laughs> you wrote a book. I just wanted to make a comment on what you said about the um, uh, uh, problem with. Uh, or the expository teaching of the scriptures today that I don't see in churches. I, I, of course, I haven't visited all the churches, but that's what attracted me to the Berean Bible Church. And the topical things that go on in teachings, but you mentioned that one of the reasons that perhaps they shy away from the expository teaching was because of, of, of passages that are difficult to handle. And they want to just kind of like teach the same nice, easy messages that go along and make everyone feel happy. Exactly. Which, and I just, I just like, people just aren't, they can't, not only reading, they're not, they're not studying, they're not reading the Bible. They're not studying, but they don't know the word. And it's yeah. hard to even invite someone to come to church, when you, uh, especially a new, a new person in Christ, mm -hmm. who are not going to get any foundational teaching at all when they believe in it. Mm -hmm. It's so sad. Yeah. And it's almost like, okay, so we, we know, looking at history, if you study the Reformation, you know, well, the Catholic Church wouldn't let people read the Word, and they had to be their end-all, be-all. And it's not like it's like that today, but if all the churches are not exhorting their people to read the Word all the time, then basically they're saying, just listen to what I say, and yeah. they're almost becoming, don't read the Word. Hmm. Not, and they're not physically saying that, but it just feels like that. They're saying, I got the authority, listen to what I say, don't go back and check up, because if you check up on them, and you challenge them. You probably have to get kicked out of church. But. <laughs> well, part of it, too, is, you know, like my dad, for instance, you know, avid reader of the Bible, um, Sunday school teacher, and all that for, you know, longer I've been alive. But because he only knows what he knows as far as he reads interpretation, the tradition. Yeah. when he reads his Bible, that's all he gets out of it is what he's been taught to believe. Yeah. So there's yeah. also that aspect of it. Yeah, well. they, they, they read it with that. With the lenses of traditional. Yeah. So, yeah. Mm -hmm.